Hi, I'm Melissa Johns. Hi, I'm Caitlin Thomaselli. And it's our pleasure to welcome you to Indigenous Digital Development Day, or DDD. DDD is a jam-packed day of online programming to take your creativity and career to the next level. As a continuation of our annual Festival Industry Days, Indigenous Digital Development Day demonstrates our commitment to fostering talent and training for Indigenous filmmakers and digital artists at all levels in their careers. Many thanks to Ontario Creates, RBC, and East Side Games for their support in making this day possible. Enjoy the event! Enjoy the event! Hello all and welcome to the second workshop in our special series today at Indigenous Digital Development Day with support from Eastside Games and RBC. My name is Melissa Johns and I'm Ganyigehaga Waginaran or Mohawk Turtle Clan and French Canadian. I'm the digital and interactive lead at Imaginative as well as an interdisciplinary artist and educator specializing in VR, digital painting and video installation. I'd like to take a moment to do a land acknowledgement. So, we at Imaginative acknowledge that this land located on present day Takaranto or Toronto is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat and Mississaugas of the Credit. We acknowledge the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, a treaty whose spirit is one based in collective stewardship and reciprocity. We take the spirit of this covenant to the core of our operations as we bring artists and audiences from many nations across the globe together through our various initiatives and activities. Please take a moment to think of the land you currently reside upon, wherever you may be, and acknowledge those who went before and those yet to come. So today I'm going to be teaching you a workflow for creating 3D assets from scratch. That means modeling, texturing, lighting, and rendering in game. In industry, these roles can be highly specialized. So there'd be four for each of the roles that I each described, uh, but there's a bit of a running joke that I'm a one woman VR studio. So if you're new to this, don't be alarmed. This workshop is ideal for both new and experienced designers, whether you'd like to learn more about 3D art in general, or you're looking for some advanced tips or tricks. If you have any questions during the session, ask me in the comments and I'll answer you as best as I can. Let's get to it, shall we? So today we're going to be creating a clock asset. And just like the cooking channel, this is the finished product first. The first thing we're starting with though is reference. Reference is vitally important, even if you're going to create something on the more fantastical side. For my work, I tend to skew photorealist. So I rely very heavily on reference and I try to get the details as close as I possibly can. So even if you were to make a sci-fi spaceship, uh, you should be relying a lot on reference from industrial sites, rivets, metal, all of that, so you can get the details right, because the details are where the magic happens. Now we can get to modeling. I use 3ds Max, but these steps can be replicated in most programs and workflows. For those who like following along with technical details, I'm also going to be listing tools on the top right-hand side of the screen. When it comes to modeling, at its core, it's the manipulation of very simple geometric components into more complicated forms. We add and subtract vectors, edges, and polygons. We extrude faces, bevel and chamfer corners, and modify positions and sizes in order to get our desired result. In this case, I'm working with a basic box form and I'm modifying its face to allow for a more curving form. A lot of modeling consists of tweaking, iterative adjustments that you can then check against your reference to make sure you're on track. Nothing is worse than getting halfway through a project and realizing that everything's wrong because you started wrong and it just snowballed from there. Once I have the exact curves I'm looking for, I can then take this new face and extrude it inwards to create a recess. I then chamfer the edges to create more of a gentle transition rather than a hard 90 degree cut. The important tools I'm mentioning here are extrude and chamfer. They're going to be your new best friends. I'm also using welding tools to combine vertices where needed in order to keep my poly count low. Even with a high resolution model, we want to optimize the number of faces and vertices so that it's less demanding for our computer to render them. That's why I'm also going to the back of the model and deleting faces that you won't actually see in the end. 
This will also help us when it comes to texturing, since there'll be more space for us when this is unwrapped. I mean, what's the point of texturing the back of an object if nobody sees it? Looking at the bottom of our model, it wasn't that long ago that this was just a simple rectangle. All I've done is to segment it and then manipulate these new segments so that they more closely resemble the beautiful curves you can get from woodworking. Again, the main tools I'm using here are chamfer, which splits one edge into two, extrude, which takes a polygonal face and allows it to extrude outwards from its origin, and the occasional weld to get rid of unnecessary vertices. Another important tool to create new segments is called Swift Loop. This tool allows us to create a new loop of edges anywhere we need one. I like to use it to map out segments initially, which I can then manipulate with our aforementioned tools. I'm currently working on the dowels of the clock, but it's easy to see how this set of techniques can be used to make organic forms like vases or pottery, as long as you're starting from a basic cylindrical form. Again, an awful lot of modeling comes down to these iterative tweaks, pushing and pulling and reshaping things until they sit just right. I'm gonna let this play out so you can see exactly what adjustments I needed to make until I was satisfied with the result. I've done a lot of work on the top of this dowel, but the bottom is still just a basic cylinder, and so is its twin on the other side of the clock. To remedy this, I'm going to use the symmetry tool to make the top and bottom the same. Once I like what I see, I can clone the object as an instance so that the second dowel always behaves like the original. If I make any adjustments to it down the road, they'll automatically apply to the instanced clone, working smarter, not harder. Now I'm working on the face of the clock. I only need a flat plane that combines a circle and a square. I've decided to do this by lining up the two planes and creating a new Boolean object. A Boolean can be used to add or subtract objects together. I'm using it for a simple application, but Booleans are very powerful objects. For example, cutting out a perfect sphere from an otherwise cube shape, or combining a ton of spheres into a single cluster to make a raspberry. That would be really hard to model by hand. All of the little bits and bobs that make up the face of the clock are modeled as simply as possible. All of their detail is going to come through in the texturing, so I'm not worried about filigrees or intense details that would really gum up and add a ton of extra polygons. There's some trial and error here, so you've probably seen me attempt to create these corner pieces a couple of different ways, and it's mainly just finding the way that works for you. I've been doing this for a few years now, and it's still totally a learning experience every time I make a new asset. Even when you think you've got the basics down pat, there's always a new technique you can pick up to streamline things, or you start thinking, what if I just like try, and then you go down some crazy rabbit hole that can either come out brilliantly or waste hours of your time and leave you frustrated. That's how you learn. Now that I'm finishing up with the clock face, the next part is going to be putting together some simple geometric forms to make the pendulum. This doesn't need to be anything advanced at all, it's mainly just a you know half sphere and a few planes and a box, uh, but I am going to use a couple different views in the viewport to help me align all of the different components. You can switch views in the viewport to show a wireframe mode of your model, which allows you to see any internal pieces, and you can use top, bottom, side, and front views to check that everything is aligned perfectly. The program has built-in grids, which are really, they're there to help you. If you're like me, something that's centered slightly off drives you crazy, and that's where the viewport is really, really useful. Now we're going to look at modeling a more complicated shape, which relies on more attention to our reference. Instead of winging it, you could, but I'm not gonna, I'm actually going to place my reference in the scene as a material applied to a plane in order to work directly on top of it. Now, using a top-down view, I can create a spline and work it along the length of this piece. I take it about halfway across because I'm going to be using symmetry again in order to keep both sides exactly the same. In our reference image, this wooden piece has several sections of varying depths. I'm going to extrude our initial spline into new sections that correspond with these depths. I'm basically mapping out which parts I want to recess and which parts I want to bulge out. 
I can then work each section accordingly and either extrude it outwards or create insets within those sections to modify it further. After a while, this flat form will take on quite a few hills and valleys that give it good dimensionality. Once I get the heights the way I like them, I'll use the chamfer tool to add more geometry. This will smooth out the appearance of the object. Instead of looking low poly and kind of sharp, it now has a more nuanced appearance. Now it's just a matter of adding symmetry and then welding problem vertices wherever you might find them. In this case, the symmetry has created a bit of an error that I now need to go through and problem solve. If a vertex isn't positioned where it needs to be in order to make sense with the geometry, the face will turn black and it just won't render properly when it's in its final form. Uh, so I basically have to weld them individually in order to correct it. This is the kind of thing I'm glad I caught early or there would be a lot of extra work down the line. The last thing I'm going to do to this component now is to use an FFD, or Freeform Distortion Tool, to just get the right shape when compared to my original reference. I just do this intuitively until I like what I see. Now that we've created our basic model, the next step in our workflow is to unwrap it. This might seem a little confusing, but it's necessary in order to have an asset that we can easily texture. I'd like you to think of a cardboard box. If we were to cut along the seams of the cardboard box, it would eventually open up into a completely flattened form, something that looks a lot like this. On the flat version of our box, we can identify all of the sections to its corresponding 3D version. From there, let's imagine we spray paint the flat version of the box with a pattern on top. What happens if we take the flat box and tape it back together? Our pattern would then apply to the newly remade box. Unwrapping 3D assets is very much the same. We want to create seams along the edges of each piece of the model so that they can be flattened out into a 2D image. At the end, we'll just have a single flat image that has all of the pieces of the model that we can work from. This works even with more complicated shapes. This particular piece may have more geometry than the rest, but it still has easily identifiable edges that we can use as seams to cut along. I'm using the point to point seam tool, which allows me to click several points and the seam is automatically calculated between them. Once I've created all of my seams, I can select the object and use a pelt map. This has two steps once you're inside the unwrap UVW menu, pelt and relax. Pelt will stretch our object across a circular frame. Yes, just like a bear skin. Relax will then allow this stretched image to take on a more natural and exact shape, kind of like tugging at the edges of a duvet once you've made your bed. Once we've flattened the pieces out, we can select them and use the Pack UVW option in our menu. This will take both of the pieces and resize them relative to one another, so one isn't way bigger than the other. It'll also pack them within the square to optimize space. Unwrapping can be kind of a tedious step, so we're just going to speed through it now that we know the basics. The important thing to remember is that we're unwrapping each piece individually using the Unwrap UVW modifier. Now that we've finished unwrapping, you'll notice that we have two versions of our clock model. For texturing, we want to export a version of the model that is entirely one piece. To do this, I select one component of the model, click Attach in the Edit Geometry menu, and then start to click Other Components in order to attach them as sub-objects. You'll notice they turn the same color as the piece I start with. Once they're attached, we can open up the UVW menu for this new model, Control a to select all, and then pack them one last time. We now have a UVW that contains flat versions of every part of the model. I'm going to export this as a PNG and show you what it looks like on screen. Now for the second version. We're going to want to keep a version of the clock that isn't attached. This is for our game engine. Let's say we want to have the hands of the clock move to tell the time, and we want the pendulum to swing back and forth. This means we need an asset that's comprised of four different pieces. The body of the clock, which doesn't move, the pendulum, which swings back and forth, and both of the hands which rotate in a circle along the face of the clock. We'll attach any static components to the main body of the clock and keep the hands and pendulum separate. Now we make sure to export these as separate objects from the very center of the project, or 000. 
I'm also checking to make sure that my assets are exporting at the right size. My 3ds Max is set to inches because Canada got some bad habits from our southern neighbor, but our game engine Unreal measures assets in centimeters, so I have a 2.54 scale conversion. Time to texture! This is my favorite part of the process as I'm coming from a digital painting and graphic design background. If you've already got the basics of graphic design down, it's very likely you'll make a good texturer. They're basically the same set of skills. For my workflow, I move between Photoshop and Substance Painter. Here I've imported the FBX of our model into Substance. You could dive right in and toss a pre-made material onto the asset, but we'd be jumping the gun a little bit. The first thing we need to do is bake our object. Baking takes the UVW and computes ambient occlusion shadows wherever they need to be, and then outputs maps for us so we don't have to paint those basic shadows in ourselves. Here's an image of two objects. One is just this static model, and then the second one has ambient occlusion baked in, just so you can see the difference. Let's talk about how texturing works. Substance Painter primarily uses layers and masks, just like Photoshop. Anything in a mask that's white will show through, and anything that's black in a mask will be hidden. For example, this is a red layer with a black mask. If we paint a white spiral onto the mask, the red will show through the spiral, but nowhere else. Once we've made a mask, we can change anything we want about the layer, but the mask will stay as is, and we can see those changes reflected on our model. We could paint all of these masks ourselves, but Substance also uses procedural generation to create complicated textures and mask them out appropriately for you. In this case, I have a red layer, which I add a mask to, and then a dirt generator. Now the red only shows through the mask where the generator tells it to, and in this case, making it look dirty. On another layer, which we'll make blue for example purposes, we can apply a pattern using a procedural mask. We can decide on the size, offset, and strength of these masks using our parameters menu. You'll now notice that the red dirt layer and the blue pattern layer now coexist with one another on top of the model. There's really no limit, so get creative, experiment, try something new, try something weird. This is a custom wood texture I've made for the clock by layering several different materials and adding some of my own. As a base, we have a subtle wood texture that I've chosen a light beige for, so it somewhat resembles pine. But all of the ready-made materials in Substance can be modified quite easily off the bat. Next I have a second layer which corresponds to any of my UVWs that are going kind of the wrong way. Uh, normally I would line them all up so they're facing vertically, but in the case of the decorative wood element on the top and a couple parts of the frame, those grains are running sideways. So for each wood layer I have, I need a second one that's running the opposite direction, or just on a 90 degree rotation. By layering these different wood materials, and by tossing in a couple of textures I found off Google that had the more swirly wood grain that I'm after, by using blending modes such as screen and multiply on these layers, I've basically created a new wood texture that doesn't resemble any of the sample ones. It's entirely custom just for this wood clock. Sometimes in my own work I have layer stacks that can be mm, 9, 10, 12 deep when you're including all of the dirt, scratching. Sometimes I just go ahead and blend them together in Photoshop from the beginning, uh, but in this case I did it in Substance. We're going to use Photoshop to texture our clock face, and here's how it works. We import the UVW map, which is right now a PNG, into a new document. I like to put a layer underneath it in a dark color so I can see the components easily. Now I'm going to lift the clock face straight out of my reference image using the selection tools. Polygonal lasso tool and circular selection tool work great here. The goal is to separate the hands of the clock from the rest of the face and smooth it out like they were never there. I'm going to make a copy of the other side of the clock with Control J and swing it over to cover the clock hands. Now it's a matter of using an eraser or mask, the clone stamp tool, and the selection tools to cleverly repaint in details that I've covered. The clone stamp tool takes information from a predetermined area and paints it over a second area of my choosing. 
we can control exactly what it affects by limiting it with the selection tools. Now that we've prepared the clock face, we're going to turn it into something we can use with masking and substance. I'm going to turn it black and white and then adjust the levels on the clock. The goal is to make the black numbers stand out as much as possible against the white for when we eventually invert them. This is going to be an alpha mask which tells a layer in substance what to show. I'm now going to create the clock face in substance using these alpha masks and some fill layers. When creating fill layers in substance, we have a few basic parameters. Our base color is exactly that, what color we have as a foundation. I'm choosing a nice blue silver tone. Roughness determines exactly how reflective this material will be. Zero is completely glossy and reflective and one is a solid matte. Metallic works in a similar way. Zero is a completely matte finish and one reflects the surrounding environment completely. On a layer above our basic blue silver, I'm creating a black fill layer. This will be the numbers on the clock face. I'm now importing the alpha map we made and setting it as the mask for this layer. Just like that, the layer now shows black through the mask we made. Just like in our earlier example, we can change the parameters of this fill layer, such as the color or roughness, but the general mask remains unchanged. I'm also going to create some height to this fill layer to create the illusion that the numbers are raised. Now I'll import another alpha to create the shiny blue details at the top of the clock face. Once my mask is in place, I'll set the fill layer to a deep blue with a low roughness and a high metallic setting. I adjust the lighting and substance by holding shift, clicking the right mouse button and dragging my mouse around to rotate the lighting. This is looking pretty good so far, so I'm going to add some brass colors on top of the silver in a new layer. I can use a brush to paint on this mask since all I need to do is add and take away circular shapes. You might be wondering why the whole asset sometimes turns gray. That's just my computer fighting with the recording software. I promise it's not typical. I'm also going to add a darker bronze color for the corner filigrees. I'm making a new layer, turning it red so I can see what I'm doing, and then setting it to mask to the filigrees only. Now I can adjust the height of the fill layer to make it seem like the filigrees have a lot of modeled detail. These tricks save you a lot of time in terms of modeling and don't put too much strain on your computer. After working through each component of our model and texturing it the way we like, we can move on to capturing it. We can capture some really gorgeous renders directly inside of Substance. I'm going to switch from painting mode to rendering mode and it'll show our model along with a panorama of our choice. I like to go with whichever neutral studio lighting best suits the asset, and I adjust the size of the render so it's a few thousand pixels tall or wide. You gotta get that high res goodness. I always make sure to save a few different renders with different lighting conditions and angles on every asset because you never know which one you're going to need the most. Documentation is really, really important. In order to move on to our final step, we need to export our beautiful textures. Under export, you can find a number of ready-made configurations. I'm going to use the Unreal Pact default, but I like to modify the base name so it defaults to something I like. We export maps for base color, ambient occlusion, roughness, metallic, normals, and alphas. Normals, by the way, are very, very similar to height, like how much something pokes out or recesses. Okay, so we've made a model, unwrapped it, textured it, and now we'd like to put it in our game engine as a proper asset. We've come a long way in a short period of time. I use Unreal as its blueprint system is a form of visual programming that's more friendly to people who aren't coders. That's me. And uh, so here I've imported the FBX, which is my base model or mesh. I've also imported the set of maps or textures that I've made in Substance Painter. 
Now I'm going to drag the model into the world and move it around as I like. It's covered in a checkerboard pattern because it doesn't have a material yet, so let's make one. You can make basic materials directly in Unreal even if you don't have maps to import. By plugging in constants into these nodes, we can put in basic values for base color, roughness, and metallic, just like Substance Painter. Once I create the material, I can drag my textures into it directly. Each of these nodes on the material correspond to a map. I start with my base material, which can also be known as a diffuse. Think of this as the basic imagery of the texture, you know, the face, the wood, all that. Next, I plug in the ambient occlusion, roughness, and metallic nodes using the channels of this AORM image. AORM stands for ambient occlusion, roughness, and metallic. The colors in this image, based on their channels, determine how shiny a material is, how metallic, and how shadowy. For example, anything in this image that's blue is a strongly metallic area. Anything that's green is a rough area, and so on. The rest is just plugging in the normals and the alpha. To account for the clear glass, I set my material so that it's two-sided and translucent to allow for masking, and then plug the alpha right in. Sometimes textures from substance don't translate perfectly. See how shiny this clock is? I'm pretty sure it didn't look that way in substance. So I'm going to add functions such as multiply and add. If we think of roughness as a number between zero and one, where zero is very shiny and one is super matte, these functions use math to modify that amount. So if I set this constant to 0.5 and I add it to the roughness, that means it takes an original value from the image and then adds 0.5 more roughness on top of it. Sounds a little confusing, but you will get used to it. We can also control these on the fly with parameters, but that's a lesson for another day. For now, I'll make it so I can use a slider to adjust exactly how rough and metallic this material is. And voila! We now have a clock asset in Unreal that's ready to be worked with whether it becomes part of a larger setting as a prop or a programmer would like to add some animation to it. Looks good, doesn't it? Nyawen, thank you so much, everyone. Keep an eye out for the next workshop with Josh Nielsen from Eastside Games, including a special message and giveaway from RBC. Onengi!